a very timid little man ventured into a biker bar in a rough neighborhood and he said, mm, which one of you gentlemen owns the Doberman that's tied to the parking meter outside? Great big giant biker guy turned on his stool, looked down at the little guy and says, it's my dog, why? And he said, well, uh, I believe my dog just killed it, sir. What, roared the big guy in disbelief, what kind of a dog do you have? Sir, it's a little four-week-old female puppy. <laughs> the biker said, how could your puppy kill my Doberman? He said, it appears that your dog choked on her, sir. <laughs> Philippians chapter 4, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your, quest, your, your request to God. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. What threatens your peace? We all have different things that threaten to take our peace from us. What causes you to be anxious? Some people go through a life with a woe is me attitude. Everything's wrong, everything's bad, everything's, you know, harmful to them. They can't, they can't get enough, they can't do enough, they can't be enough, they can't, you know, they're always striving, always longing, they're never satisfied, and they don't have peace. You probably all know somebody like that. Maybe a coworker, maybe a neighbor, somebody that just always always down they don't have peace but Romans 8 18 says says I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us people ask me how I am and I say well life is hard but God is good there's a new normal in this vintage we're in it seems like it's normal to have aches and pains. It's a new, it's a new normal. If, if, if I didn't have an ache or a pain, I'd think, am I dead? <laughs> because they're always there. We're part, it's part of the curse. Our bodies wear out. But we tend to occupy our thoughts with whatever's going on in life. If everything is just peachy, we are positive on our attitude about life. If I catch the biggest trout in the river every time I go fishing, then I'm happy. If I miss the biggest buck I've ever seen, I'm gonna be gloomy. Of course, I don't hunt anymore, so that's not really applying to me. But it's human nature to gear our emotions to everything that's going on around us. When our children and our grandchildren or on the winning team in soccer or football or whatever they're into, we're happy and proud, but we're sad if they lose. When the Republicans win, the Democrats are disappointed. And when the Democrats win, the Republicans are upset. It just seems that we allow the world's ebb and flow to decide for us whether or not we are happy, whether or not we have joy, whether or not we say that God is good, whether or not we have peace, that Republican convention after that attempt on President Trump, people were all happy and upbeat and joyful because that attempt didn't happen and people were all saying that God is good. And even the president said, the hand of God was with me and um, you know, whether or not we have peace, God is good. God is always good. Life is hard, but God is good. And because God is good, I have peace. Because God is good and I know where I'm going. And the older I get, the closer I am to seeing 
the face of God. We need to remember that we're in the world, but we're not of the world. My little amen sign isn't working, by the way, because I need to put batteries in it. You don't have to say amen on your own. So this world, meaning the sinful God-opposing world system, is not a friend of God. We are the friends of God. We are. Therefore, we shouldn't be surprised when things seem not to go our way. What should we do? Rise above it. The world that we live in is also under the curse. So we can expect some trials and tribulations along with the victories. Rise above it. No matter how things, how things, how hard things got for Paul, he was able to rise above it and do great things for God. 2 Corinthians 11 says this, starting with verse 24, five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Five times he was whipped by the Jews. Three times I was beaten with rods. Can you imagine how scarred he was? Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. We only know about the one, but there were three shipwrecks. I spent a night and the day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, danger from bandits, danger from my fellow Jews, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the country, danger at sea, and danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and I've often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Paul had a cushy life as a Pharisee when he was younger. He was given the task of capturing those pesky Christians and bringing them back to be sentenced by the Sanhedrin. But he gave up that easy life because of an encounter with Jesus whom he was persecuting. And I think I'm having a real bad day if I get a strawberry seed under my dentures. Or if I have a backache. I think I'm having a real bad day if there's a toothache in my toe, otherwise known as gout. There will always be some kind of trouble, but I just need to rise above it. Scripture always helps. Jesus said this in John 16, 20 to 24. Very truly, I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. In other words, what seems to make the world happy makes us sad, makes us grieve. At least in my time, this is more true than ever before. And continuing, you will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. Here Jesus promises both grief and joy to believers. Rise above it. Better things are coming. Though he was talking to to. To those who would be in grief at the crucifixion, but joyful at the resurrection. Then they would face trials in ministry, but their joy would come when they were able to bring the gospel into someone's life. It just one conversion, one person you lead to the Lord. There's so much joy that overcomes so much frustration that joy remains today ministry is hard and we're all ministers but joy comes in with fruit of ministry and then verse 21 a giving a woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come but when her baby is born she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world so with you 
Now is your time of grief, maybe. Life comes in seasons. The season of grief is when we're serving God, carrying the light of the gospel into dark places because we will have opposition. We will have trials. We will have hardship. We have to rise above it. God is with us. And continuing that verse, but I will see you again and you will rejoice and no one will take away your joy. At the second coming, we will be secure in him and our joy at being with him will be permanent. No more tears. Verse 23, in that day you will no longer ask me anything. Very truly I tell you, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. Complete joy is joy that cannot be added to. It can't be improved upon. Complete joy is all the joy you'll ever need. It's complete. Then we will have risen above it permanently. There's a divide in this world between the sinners without God and we sinners who are saved by grace through faith in our Lord. Everyone starts out evil and condemned. There is none righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Some get saved and strive to be holy. Some remain in their sinful state. Many sinners, sinners seem like they are doing fine. Things are not what they seem to be. Here's what David recommends in Psalm 37. Says, do not fret because of those who are evil or be envious of those who do wrong. We're not to look with an anxious or evil or envious eye at what sinners seem to enjoy. They suppose the, their supposed good life is going to disappear. They're headed for destruction. All the benefits that have been accrued to them in this world Worldly life will get them nowhere with God. He's not impressed. Verse 2, for like grass they will soon wither. Like green plants they will soon die away. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. The promise has no time specified. Maybe now, maybe later. What are the desires of your heart? If the desire of your heart is wrapped up in the trappings of this world and leaves God out, he, he's not obligated. If I become convinced that God wants me to have a bigger house than I can afford or a truck that I can't afford, and then I can't pay my tithes because of the obligation. God's not impressed. But if the desire of my heart is to be in His will, if the desire of my heart is to spread the gospel, to get people saved, to build a church, then of course God will give me the desire of my heart. If the desire of my heart is to see God and be with him in eternity, then he will give me the desire of my heart. Verse five, commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will do this. He will make your righteousness, righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Patience isn't easy sometimes, is it? Be still and wait patiently. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. Verse eight, refrain from anger 
and turn from wrath. Do not fret, it leads only to evil. For those who are evil will be destroyed, but those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. A little while, and the wicked will be no more. Though you look for them, they will not be found. But the meek will inherit the land and enjoy peace and prosperity. Verse 12, the wicked plot against the righteous and gnash their teeth at them. But the Lord laughs at the wicked, for he knows their day is coming. You don't have to look too far to see wickedness gnashing their teeth at the believers. The original apostles were all martyred except for John. Christians have always been persecuted. In North Korea, being a persecution carries a death sentence. This country was founded on the freedom of religion, not the freedom from religion. This country was founded on Judeo-Christian principles. There are powerful forces in this country who think that the Christian faith is evil. Christian faith is the way, is in the way of their cherished values, which I'm bold enough to say are stupid cherished notions. The founder of socialism in this country had a list of three evils, religion, the nuclear family, and private property. They want religion to be replaced with secular humanism. And they're on the rise. Globalism, extreme environmentalism, honor for homosexuality, abortion, euthanasia, and the latest one, gender madness, is what I call it. They're all on the rise. In my own lifetime, these things have all changed. Traditionally, Judeo-Christian ethics was the, was, the, was the norm, was the rule. But that stuff is all on the decline. Churches are shrinking. Evil that lurks in the heart of man is becoming unleashed. Evildoers have favor in high places. They enjoy favor in the universities, favor in the main, mainstream press, favor in government. Our moral values are, are opposed to most of, most, of, most of what they want to do. Not much different from the Roman persecution of Christians in the early church. There were 10 persecutions between Nero and Diocletian. When the evildoers in the, in the world seem to prosper, when they do well because the world smiles on them, when the world seems to be working against you, rise above it. When the world seems to be working against you and you don't have peace, rise above it. Don't go down into it. Rise above it because God loves you. No matter what you get from the world, no matter how hard things get, Rise above it. John 16, 33, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Do you have peace with yourself? Some people carry guilt. They have something in their past, maybe a lot of things in their past, that to keep dwelling on. Satan is your accuser. He brings those thoughts up in you. He tries to keep you from the peace that God wants you to have. But Isaiah 43, 18 and 19 says this, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. Some of us don't have peace with other people. Peace with others 
it needs an attitude adjustment. If you dwell on hurts, then you will hurt. Some people are hurt by a church, by their families. When I grew up in a funeral home, after about the third day, that, back, that was back in a three-day viewings, some of the people in a family, brothers and sisters, were at each other's throats about things. No peace. They dwell on the hurts, and they're going to remember that forever. Unless they get saved. And God reigns instead of hurts. If you've been offended, don't dwell on the hurt. Dwelling on the hurt will be an obstacle to your progress in God. Ephesians 4, 1 to 3. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Make every effort. And this is Hebrews 12, 14. It repeats that. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy without holiness. No one will see the Lord. Thank God this church doesn't have contentions and people upset with each other about dumb things. But there are churches, we, I've been in churches where people just fuming at each other. I told you this one. Girl, a woman came to me and she was all upset and this was when we didn't have a pastor. I sort of, I was running the church until we got a new pastor and she wanted to talk to me and she was all upset because this other woman had a piercing right here in her lip. <laughs> And she and her and her husband ran the sound booth. Well, she shouldn't be in there because she has a thing on her lip. <laughs> I said, you have a scripture for this? So she's reading something from Leviticus about adornments. I said, you know, Leviticus was all over after the cross. Well, well, she's, I said, what are these things hanging in your ears? Oh, that's different. No, it's not different. It's a cultural thing. But that's, that's just stupid stuff. Stupid. I don't care if John, that plays the drums, has a hat on backwards in here. I don't care. Show me in the Bible where it says you shouldn't have a hat on backwards. Show me. But we get these sensitivities because of cultural stuff, and that's just being dumb. Anyway, and then there's peace with God. That's the big one, peace with God. If you're at odds with God, you aren't saved. When a person comes to Christ, the old is gone. You're a new creature in Christ. He paid the debt. Now you're set free from the law of sin and death. And what should reign in your heart is gratitude and anticipation of being with God. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 and 19. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Verse 19, that God was reconciling the world unto himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. And James 31, 34, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Again, this metaphor states that God will, remember, will not remember or hold our forgiven sins against us. Micah 7, 19, you will cast all our sins into the depth of the sea. Here, the depth of the sea represents the complete removal of our transgressions. When we come to Christ, 
and repentance and humility. God wants everyone to be at peace with him. Salvation brings the peace that passes all understanding. So we need to stay faithful. Remember, the Lord in everything you do. Stay in the word. Take a substantial dose of the word every day. Be hearers and doers of the word. In all things give thanks, have a grateful heart, and rise above that, above things, negative things, rise above it. God will triumph over evil, and your joy is in his triumph. Matthew chapter 11, 28, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. If you have, if you can't find peace, if you can't be at rest in your heart, you need to rise above it. You need to dwell on the goodness of God instead of the harm that is around you, whether it's from other people, no matter what it's from. The world is not our friend. God is our friend. Amen? So I say to you, rise above it. And I'm done talking now. Would you stand? Father God, it's been good to be in your house today. It's been good to be with people of like precious faith in the house today. It's been good to have an opportunity to handle your word and bring it to the table in this house, Lord. And I pray for all of us, Lord, the ones that are not here and the ones that are here, for your blessings to rest on us, Lord, and just stay with us and keep us from harm until we meet again, in Jesus' name, amen. Praise God.